Oh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to get you all suffering from cheesecake-induced coma. I think. <laughs> I think I'm suffering myself for that. Um, I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to, uh, to be here today, and I appreciate the organizers inviting me. And actually, there's a little bit of a change from, from really what your published um, program said. I'm not really going to talk so much about antiplatelet therapy. It's more about platelet function testing with some allusion to um, to aspirin resistance, and I'll touch on clopidogrel resistance uh, just before I close. So I really want to, want, to, want to start with where most of us really are in the clinical laboratory in regards to how we test uh, a patient that, that we suspect is having a potential platelet function defect. And although this is not really the purview of the, uh, of the laboratory, um, I, the most important part to, to really to emphasize, and I'll come back to this, is that the best single test for hemostasis, I think, is probably the patient history. We don't get to do this, and uh, the physician obviously does this, and a lot of times I suspect it's not done as well as it might be. But I'll come back to this um, briefly when I talk about uh, preoperative testing. That's probably the most single important test you can do is actually ask the patient some questions. And then, of course, we're going to run a CBC, and we'll do a platelet count to make sure they haven't got acute leukemia, and make sure they've got enough platelets to, uh, to do the job of hemostasis. And then, for the, for the most part, our workup for primary hemostasis or platelet function is going to be a, the, the time-honored bleeding time, and I'll have a few words to say about that, um, or the PFA 100 or some other test of, of primary platelet function. And that's pretty much it for, for most laboratories. I'm not really, obviously, we all do PTs and APTTs, but I'm just considering the, the platelet function. Now, the bleeding time, of course, has been around for, for many, many years, and, and most of us have been exposed to that for a lot of our career. And I'm probably preaching to the choir if I start to tell you uh, about all the, the disadvantages of the bleeding time. I think, you know, if I, I used to have slides of advantage and disadvantage, I think we all do that. Those of us that speak about laboratory methods have a slide for advantages and disadvantages. There really isn't a slide for advantages of the bleeding time, I suspect. So we'll just talk about the downsides of that. Uh, of that test briefly as a segue into some other methodologies. Well, traditionally we've used the bleeding time, um, as you can see on this slide, we've used it as a screening test for both congenital and acquired platelet dysfunction. We've used it as a screening test for uh, von Willebrand's disease, and uh, Dr. Kessler alluded to that in his presentation earlier on. Uh, we use it um, also, uh, particularly from surgeons and anesthesiologists, as a way of trying to screen out those that have recently ingested aspirin or, or similar antiplatelet medications that might, uh, might be uh, not desirable for whatever procedure the patient's about to have. But 95% in actual fact of the nation's bleeding times historically have been done for the purpose of preoperative risk assessment. And way back, I think, in, uh, in 1990, is a, a huge paper published by Rogers and Levin, which really synthesized the, all the published data on the clinical value of the bleeding time, particularly as it, re as it relates to preoperative risk assessment. And uh, that paper really didn't receive an awful lot of airtime, possibly because it was 120 pages long and mainly comprised of large tables. And so it wasn't really bedtime reading for anybody unless you really want to induce sleep. So uh, that paper went largely, I think, unnoticed by um, the, the hematology community. And it wasn't really until eight years later when CAP and ASCP brought together uh, a, a position statement which was published, I think, uh, quite smartly in a surgical journal and really synthesized the major uh, conclusions from that Rogers and Levin's paper. And you see those conclusions on your slide here. And they are really in the absence of a positive clinical history for bleeding. The bleeding time does not predict bleeding associated with surgery. In fact, the, the, the biggest factor that affects bleeding in surgery is the surgeon himself, a surgical technique. We shouldn't be too surprised, I think. Um, the reverse of that is also true, that a normal bleeding time does not exclude the possibility of surgical bleeding. And finally, the bleeding time doesn't really identify those individuals who have recently ingested drugs which are known to interfere with platelet function. So for all these reasons, I think the, the, the race has been on for a number of years to try to find substitutes for the bleeding time. And over the years, a variety of tests have, have come and have gone again. And you know, they're listed on this slide here, and I won't really spend any time talking about them. But the, the penultimate one on that slide, the Thrombostat 4000, did morph into a, an instrument that many of us are using in our laboratories today. And, and Dr. Kester mentioned it in his presentation earlier, and that's the platelet function analyzer, or PFA 100. And I suspect that most of you are already very familiar with the principle of this instrument. 
But the reason it's so convenient to the clinical laboratory is it is uh, able to be used with that same citrated uh, whole blood sample, and I fully accept the warts pointed out to us by Dr. Mann of using citrate, um, but we've been using it historically, and we use it for our PTs and PTTs, and those specimens come into our coagulation laboratories, and so it's, it's very convenient to be able to run that platelet function test on that same kind of blood sample. And so the principle of PFA is that blood, whole blood is aspirated through a fine stainless capillary that creates a shear force, activates the platelets which then come in contact with a membrane coated in collagen. So platelets do what platelets do best, they stick to that membrane. Um, and that uh, adhesion is mediated by a von Willebrand factor. And the membrane also contains one or two aggregating agents, either epinephrine or ADP. And so uh, following on adhesion, you get plate aggregation. And ultimately, the hole or aperture in that membrane is sealed by a platelet plug. And the flow through this system ceases. And the time taken to, uh, to achieve uh, a cessation of flow is called the closure time. And that's the value reported from this instrument in say. And as I uh, alluded to, there are two cartridges, uh, two cartridge systems, the collagen epinephrine or a Kepi cartridge, which is used as a, a, as a way of screening initially for uh, uh, platelet dysfunction. And then a secondary cartridge, the CADP cartridge, which is typically used for the most part to differentiate a true platelet function defect, quote unquote, from a defect induced by, for example, aspirin, because the ADP cartridge is relatively aspirin insensitive. So a prolonged epinephrine closure time with a normal ADP closure time is usually, but I hasten to add not always, uh, indicative of uh, the presence of the aspirin effect. Oops. Now, some years ago, uh, we did some work for uh, Dave Baring, who market the PFA, in an attempt to compare the PFA with the bleeding time. And we did a, a, a relatively small study, 113 patients, hospital inpatients, that were having bleeding times as part of their routine medical care. I'm sure many of you have seen these data. They've been presented many times now. And the, the upshot, as you can see in this uh, two by two table, is that about 73% of the, of the patients would have been classified as normal or abnormal by either one of the tests. In other words, there was about a 73% concordance between the bleeding time and the, and the PFA 100. But it's always more interesting, I think, with these kind of experiments to look at the, uh, the nature of those samples that were discordant, that didn't agree. Now, the majority of, of discordant samples, as you can see, come in the, in the lower left uh, quadrant of this two by two table, and those are the samples that have a normal bleeding time and an abnormal PFA, and about 20% of our patients fell into that category. So we were anxious to find out whether or not the PFA was was lying to us, uh, whether the you know the bleeding time really there really wasn't a defect. And the, PFA was picking something up that really wasn't there. So we also did a series of, of aggregation studies in all those samples. And we found, in fact, that 20 out of those 23 patients that were discordant also had one or more abnormalities in a platelet aggregation profile. So we concluded from that, really, that the PFA was telling the truth, that uh, these were defects of primary hemostasis. And we went on to look at the, this comparison a little bit more closely. And you can see that overall, we see about a 70 to 80% concordance between these two tests. These data have been uh, validated in subsequent studies now. But for those of you that are just bringing in this uh, assay, the first thing you notice is you get a lot more abnormal results with a PFA than you do with a bleeding time. And this really is a function of the additional sensitivity of the PFA to the presence of aspirin. And studies have shown that about 60 to 70 percent of all hospital inpatients are on one or more medications known to interfere with platelet function. And aspirin, of course, is highly prevalent uh, amongst those medications. So this is really what you're seeing. A number of studies have shown that, in fact, the bleeding time picks up a lot of congenital uh, abnormalities fairly well, and uh, the two tests are about equivalent in that regard. But the PFA is un unquestionably more sensitive to von Willebrand's disease. And if you, certainly if you do any number of bleeding times in our institution back in 1998, I think, 99, when we did this work, uh, our institution, which is a very large institution in central Florida, was doing 400 template bleeding times a month. Uh, so it was very, very cost effective for us to, uh, to switch to a PFA and, and we're down to running about 160 PFAs a month. So we lost a lot of those, those uh, primary platelet function screens and most of those were the preoperative testing, uh, for preoperative testing purposes.